Good morning, church family. Welcome to the Phoenix Fellowship Live. And we are so glad you're here today. I know you're listening all the way and watching all the way from Maine to California. And we're so glad you're here. We hope you get an amazing blessing today. Yes, we do. And I would like to pray that God's Spirit will be present with us as we worship and as we study His Word. So let's bow our heads wherever we are and invite God's presence into this place. Father in heaven, thank you this morning. Thank you this morning, Father, for giving us Jesus Christ and for the Holy Spirit which has been sent to us. Those who believe receive him into their lives and heart, and he lives within us. It is barely an incarnation of divinity in us, in a sense, just as Jesus took upon himself human nature. We are so glad that your spirit has been given to us, and I pray that he will speak and move in us today as we open your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you all. Come up and sit on Grammy's quilt with me. We're going to talk about a creation that God made that I want you to guess, see if you can guess what the name of this bird is. But this bird is an extremely intelligent bird. It bends twigs to make and use tools. Can you believe that? And it has a familiar call. Call! Call! Can you guess what that bird is called? That's right! That's right, a crow. Crows have excellent memories. They can remember faces. And they are a large black bird, black in color, and they have a fairly significant beak. They're about 17 to 19 inches long. So they're a good sized bird. Um, crows have a, a relative of theirs that you have also thought probably heard of and it's called a raven. And ravens can be told the difference between them is not big, but you can recognize it if you know. And that is a raven is a larger bird than a crow. And it has a harsher voice. And it has a heavier, bigger bill. And its tail and wings come together to form a point at the end. Whereas with a crow, the tail is fanned out when it flies. And you can see that very distinctly. Crows are monogamous. That means they have one mate their whole life. And they both, both the male and the female, care for the young in the nest. Now, crows are smart. They can solve problems that are up to like a five to a seven-year-old human. Wow, that's probably as old as some of you are. Crows hold grudges. They remember a face when it's been mean to them. Um, they did a test and they put a mask on a man and he acted aggressively toward a group of crows. And then every time they would walk with that man with that particular mask on, the crows would be so upset and dive around toward that man. And they the crows taught up to four to five generations out that that mask, that particular face, was dangerous. That's pretty interesting. 
Now, crows are um, omnivorous. That means they eat just about anything. They are not particular about what their diet is. And their nests are about one and a half to two feet in diameter. That's a big nest. And they make their nests out of twigs and hair and cloth and moss and plants. So they make their nests out of a box, just about everything. Now crows live up to 14 years in the wild, but in captivity, they can live as long as 20 years. So that's an interesting point. Now I have a video today and I'm going to let you listen and see if you can make out the human speech that this crow is saying. He's saying a word. So let's listen and see if you can hear it. Did you hear it? Did you hear what it was? He said, hello. Let's listen to it one more time. Okay, you could hear it. He said, hello. That's because he was trained to do that. Crows have clutches. That's what their nest, their eggs are called, clutches. And they have three to nine eggs in a clutch. And crows do some of the most interesting things. I think they're my favorite bird. Um, crows do something very interesting with nuts. They fly to a signal, a regular stop signal with a light and they will drop nuts on the pavement and wait for the cars to roll over them. Then they wait for the light to turn red and they will swoop down and get those nuts. They didn't have to do any work, just dropping them there. Is that not smart, but so intelligent? God made crows to be intelligent. And, you know, we can learn so much from that. We can use our intelligence for good or for bad. All the days of our life, we make those choices. And we, I think God wants us to use our intelligence for good and to be loving and kind and thoughtful and gentle. Let's do that today. And let's don't forget about the crows and what fabulous birds they are. That God made. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for the crows, and I thank you for the children listening to my voice. Bless them, Lord, each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. So good to see you. See you next week. So, honey, since we've been married, you've told me a lot of stories about your childhood, and every one of them has intrigued me. <laughs> I wish I could have been there with you and grown up with you, had the fun that you've had as a kid. And the hard times, I wish I could have been there with you to go through the hard times. <laughs> but one of the stories that you shared with me some time ago is a story about Disneyland before it was. And I'm just wondering if you would share that story with our audience this morning. Well, um, what I recall, as I was between 10 and 12 years old, is I was sitting in the back seat of my mom's car, and I think it was one of my older sisters that was sitting in the front. And uh, we were driving down Harbor Boulevard, Harbor Boulevard and we're going north and my mom said look over there you guys that's the parcel of land that's been designated for Disneyland and I remember saying what's Disneyland and they said well that's going to be a new place that's going to be built for fun and entertainment for families and I remember looking over there and just seeing nothing but masses of orange groves mm. and thinking 
hmm, how can this be, you know? Really? So that's what I recall. So after you telling me that story, I actually looked up on the internet and found a picture oh, neat. of what that land probably looked like about 1953, which was a couple of years before Disneyland was built. I'm going to pull that up on the screen for everybody so they can they can see that. So you're saying that all of that land out there was pretty much orange groves, and that's what it looks like right now uh -huh. in that picture. You can't see it up close, but it looks like groves of trees. Yeah. And so that's that's what you saw. Yep. So I interesting. Did. So, so another question I have, and you've told me stories of this too, is did you ever work at Disneyland? I did. I worked there from when I was 16 through, I think, till I was like 19 or maybe going on 20. I actually worked there um, my senior year in high school and um, then on for my college years. I used that for income. Okay. And did you ever get to meet Walt Disney? I did meet Walt Disney. He was on the street and we were told to keep him moving, to just shake his hand and keep him moving so that the guests would just not overwhelm him. And I understand that there were some rules for the employees about how they were to behave while they are on duty as far as their disposition was concerned. Yes, it's where I learned about customer service because you were only supposed to be super friendly and smiling and gracious to all the guests and never anybody was ever to be contentious or anything. Uh, where did you work at Disneyland? Okay, my first job, I worked in three different locations. My first job was at Carnation Land on Main Street I think that's still there. I'm not sure. And um, I worked there as a what they called a hostess. You just took orders. You didn't make anything. You just delivered them to the tables. Mm -hmm. And you were. They had spot checkers to make sure everyone was friendly and nice. But it was very fun. I can remember having such a good time working there. It was mm -hmm. very fun. But and you... and then my second job was at a candle, um, it was called a candle shop, and it no longer exists and haven't for 25 years or more. But um, it was between the Emporium and the clock shop, and um, I can remember having a difficulty because there was so much fragrance in oh, that yeah, room. I, bet. I remember standing out front a lot of times <laughs> waiting for people to come in and be friendly to them, but oh, it was yeah. terribly fragrant. <laughs> you also told me about an occasion where some people from, I think they, you said they were from Japan, had come over and they were purchasing. Yeah, tell me about that story. Okay, so my third job was at the Emporium, and that's where I work. The, continuation of my time at Disneyland. And I worked as a, as a clerk there, and it was a, a, a small store that they basically had for, you know, different clothing that was Disneyland oriented and everything. But um, people would come and they would bring your, their wares up to the cashier stand. And I would, you know, put their numbers into the cashier and everything. And they did not know the currency at all. And so they would just hand me, they would just put their money in their hand and just hand it to me. And I would pick out the amount of money that they needed to give. So there was a lot of honesty that needed to be going into that job uh, yes. because people just weren't aware of the currency at all. Yeah. And there was a lot of trust that they put in you when they did that. Oh yeah, I mean, but everyone was so kind. I never had anyone that was contentious or irritable or anything. That was a world all its own. And that's what I was going to ask you. Was Disneyland at that time, at least, a place where people could go and find only happy? Absolutely. That was one of the uh, initi 
in their initial interview, they wanted to let you know you had to have the kind of disposition that was friendly and outgoing and, you know, kind to people because they wanted to portray a not a realistic picture, but they wanted the best picture they could portray of humanity there. It was supposed to be magical and fun yeah. and enjoyable for everyone. And isn't that what Disneyland has always been, magical? Like, I know the, uh, the uh, park that, that Disney uh, built in Orlando, Florida is actually called uh, Magic Kingdom. And uh, in a sense, Disneyland is the same, a magic place where people can go and their imaginations can go wild and they can be in a friendly place where everything is good and light and wonderful and escape real life and <laughs> leave it outside the gate. Yes, yes, that's so true. Well, I wish I could have known you then. I, <laughs> I love you so much, Sammy. and. Uh, you have carried with you into our relationship all those sweet traits of graciousness and warmth and courtesy and honesty. And I just want Thank our you. church family to know that there is a place where we can go even today where those conditions exist. There is a place. And that's what I want to talk about this morning when we actually uh, get more into the sermon today. So Sounds thank you so much, my love, for sharing this experience with me first and now with those who are listening. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good morning again. This morning we're going to talk about a kingdom a kingdom, a literal place. I'm going to take you to a place that the Bible talks about, a kingdom. We recently, just a few minutes ago, talked about a couple of kingdoms here on earth that are magical, magic kingdom and Disneyland, a place where people like to go, particularly children, to find fun. And it's a happy place. It's where a place where people are dressed in costume, beautiful costumes, some of them. They have beautiful faces, some of them. Some of them have imaginary character faces, but they're literal characters that you can shake hands with. They are pleasant and they bring joy to the hearts of kids, plus all of the things that they can do on their rides that give them excitement and joy. It's a place where people can go, particularly children. And it might be well for us to become children this morning as we investigate this very interesting kingdom that is spoken of in the Bible. And we would like to begin our study by opening to Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three. And I would like to read verses one through three. In those days, it says, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. I like the way it actually is reading in Isaiah itself, where this verse is taken from, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 3 to 5, and I would like to read that as a follow-up to this verse, Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, it says there, Isaiah says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then it goes on to tell how those low places will be um, filled in and lifted up, and the high places will be brought down so that the road is smooth, and the rough places are taken out so that the king can have a safe and comfortable passage down this highway. We have a highway, we have a kingdom, and we have a king. 
It is a new world, a new life, a new reality that John the Baptist is announcing there in the Judean wilderness, desert, as he proclaims the approach of the coming of the kingdom of God. Did I say this already? This phrase, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, which are interchangeable, occurs in the New Testament over a hundred times. This is an important subject, and I feel so blessed this morning to be able to share with you what God has placed upon my heart and has inspired my heart with as I have studied it in hopes that it will be, bring joy and excitement to your own heart. This morning I said to Sammy, as I was preparing, finishing up the touches on this message, I said to her, God is so amazing. God is so amazing. God had brought to my mind a thought that I would like to share with you that I had not thought of prior in the preparation of this message. These messages that I prepare for you from God, I believe, from his word, sometimes have to ferment in my mind. They gather texts together. I, I study various thoughts. I try to outline certain ideas that I want to present that I believe come from the scriptures. And I had done all that, and all of a sudden, we were on our walk this morning. And it was like, God gave me something new to share with you today. And it is, God is so amazing. He is so ingenious. Look at this. Here is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who flung the stars into space, whose number are countless, the limits of the universe being limitless. This Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, was sent to us in a very small heavenly package hidden in humanity and delivered to Bethlehem Earth. <laughs> this package of power, of majesty, of divinity sent to us, hidden in a small package in a remote place, as remote as the stables of Bethlehem, where God sends him to us to be all that he turns out to be for us, that makes us a kingdom, that makes us and gives us eternity, that gives us his presence, gives us so many things that we're going to talk about in a moment. But in that package, God was in that package himself. And in that package, he came bound in our human flesh and bound to our family. No one suspected who or where he was, really, until he was 30 years old. And John the Baptist is on the shores of the Jordan River announcing the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And yes, Herod heard about it because the wise men came and they wanted to know where this star was leading them. The shepherds knew about it because the angels broadcast it from the heavenly skies. But really, other than a very small group of people, those who were looking for him to come, those who were wondering when he would come and how he would come and when he would appear. No one really suspected who or where he was until he was about 30 years old, the Bible says. In this package that came to us from heaven, the Son of God, and in him the seed of the kingdom of heaven that we're going to talk about this morning was virtually untouchable. It was, it was a package. It was a person. It was the divine Jesus Christ. 
that was hidden in humanity, hidden in a baby, hidden in a poor family, hidden in a stable, and gradually grew up as he developed into that one who would walk the streets of Jerusalem, the paths of Palestine, and live out and bring to us the kingdom of heaven. So John the Baptist is there on the, the banks of the Jordan River announcing the kingdom of God was coming. And he was saying, prepare the way, repent. And repent, in, if you really look at repent, all of a sudden, you know, in our minds as having come, many of us from a very conservative background, we think of uh, confessing our sins and, and changing our ways and, and making sure that our lives are what they should be. No, repent. The repent in the Bible means it means to turn your back, turn the, a different direction, turn your back on your spotted past, turn your back on your sin and your guilt, turn your back on the past, turn your perspective differently on the present, Change your perspective on the present, which I hope you will do this morning, and look toward a future in the kingdom of Jesus Christ here on earth and an experience with him that will bring new joy, new happiness, new excitement, new blessing to your life. That's what it was to repent. Turn your back on the past. Change your perspective of the present and look to the future with Christ. So he's proclaiming this on the banks of the Jordan, but that's in Matthew 3, verses 1 to 3. If you just go into the next chapter, chapter 4, guess what we see? Chapter 4, it says, now when, verse 12, chapter 4, Matthew, chapter 12, verse, sorry, Matthew 4, verse 12, Matthew, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he got thrown in prison for this. No wonder. He was proclaiming the kingdom of heaven in a kingdom of darkness. And that's always what happens. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness are in juxtaposition of one another. And there is a contrast and often animosity from the kingdom of darkness for the light that is coming in the kingdom of heaven. And so John is thrown into prison. And it says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. He remember, he went to Nazareth, the next verse says. And in Nazareth, they kicked him out. He was reading in the temple that Sabbath morning. And uh, he was applying a prophecy of Isaiah to himself about being the one who was to come the Messiah, to heal the brokenhearted, to open the eyes of the blind, to open the ears, as it were, of, the, of the, the deaf, spiritually deaf, to release the captives. These things happened there in Nazareth after he had left the Jordan area, and he went up and they kicked him out. So where did he go? The next verse says, he went to Capernaum which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet. It's always following a fulfillment of prophecy. Like Jesus' life was a life of fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. And in Isaiah, it says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Jesus was there to bring light to the darkness, to bring the kingdom of heaven into the, into the environment of the kingdom of darkness. 
He came to do that. In fact, we'll read this text toward the end of our message today, but as he was standing before Pilate, Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus said, for this reason I was born. He told, he told Pilate that at his trial. So in verse 17 it says, now John the Baptist was preaching. Now we find in 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say what? He carried the same message as John the Baptist. He also was announcing the kingdom of heaven. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in the verses that follow, we begin to see him gathering together the patrons of his kingdom, disciples. There in Capernaum, he called Peter and John and James and Andrew and Matthew, and he began to collect his patrons, the patrons of his kingdom there as his disciples came to him. And then in verse 23 of that same chapter, get this picture because it's, 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 a, it's a picture of life in the kingdom as Jesus preaches the kingdom. Verse 23 through 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is it that's going to be preached to all the world before Jesus returns? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. Then it says, and that's connected, that's part of kingdom life, the presence of God in this earth, his kingdom in this earth brings healing of disease. It brings light to the blind, eyesight. It brings hearing to the deaf ears. It brings it brings hope to those in darkness. And it says his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. The kingdom of heaven was present there. And it says, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Jesus had followers. They were gathering to him like multitudes. How about the 5,000 that he fed as he was teaching on the hillside overlooking Galilee? 5,000 men plus women and children. Who knows how many were there that day? And then the 4,000 he fed. Again, the Bible says 4,000 men plus women and children. The crowds were tremendous. He was building his kingdom on earth. And then in Matthew 10, Matthew 10, we have Jesus sending out the 12. Before this, in, in chapter 5, he has talked about the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes, the first Beatitude, blessed are those, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the last one is, blessed, blessed are those, when you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say falsely, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was a prominent subject on the lips of Jesus Christ as he taught. In Matthew 13, which we aren't going to read today, but if you just look through Matthew 13, over and over again, Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like, it's like a hidden treasure. It's like a precious pearl. It's like a farmer who went out and sowed his seed in a field. It's like a man who arranged a marriage for his son. It's like 10 virgins who are going to a wedding. Constantly, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven in his ministry. And then he was living out 
living out the power of that kingdom and all of the healing and the touching of hearts through his message. So in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, and beginning with verse um, 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, What did he tell them to do? Verse 7, Matthew 10 and verse 7 says, This is what he told them to do. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. All signs of the power of the kingdom and the presence of the kingdom in the earth. Do these things as a demonstration that the kingdom of God has come. So beautiful. Then the next chapter, I mean, is, is this, this is just a story that goes through the whole book of Matthew and Luke and John and Mark in chapter 11. Get this, this is, this is, so, this is so cool. In Matthew chapter 11, this is the story where messengers come from the prison where John the Baptist is being held. And he says, would you go and ask Jesus if he is the one who is to come or if we are to expect another? And Jesus said to them, go tell John these things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then I want to skip over to verse, to verse 12, where Jesus is actually talking about John to the crowd and saying what, a, what an instrument of heaven he had been. And he says, in verse 12, he says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Listen, <laughs> this is so exciting. The kingdom of heaven was being built. People's hearts were being touched by Christ. They saw the power of heaven in him, the king of the kingdom. And it says, the violent take it by force. Well, it wasn't the violent in a bad sense. The Greek word used there is biadzo. Biazzo, which means to press or to crowd oneself into with utmost earnestness and effort. Luke chapter 16 and verse 16 bears out that thought. It says, Jesus speaking again, this is Luke's version, he says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. Multitudes followed him. We already talked about the 5,000, the 4,000, crowds, so that he had sometimes to move into one of the boats along the shore to be, to be, to release that, that um, crowdedness so that he could actually sp speak to the people without being crowded in. And there's another text in Matthew 21 that also shows the present existence of the kingdom of God as Jesus came to bring it to us. In this case, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He has just told them the story of two sons, a parable of two sons. One, the father told him not to go out into the vineyard and to work that day and one of them said absolutely dad i sure will but he didn't and another son said, said no i don't want to but then he ended up doing it and his question to the pharisees was which one did the will of the father there was an implication there that they got i'm sure 
They had claimed to be servants of God, but they weren't doing his work. They were the elder son, so to speak. So Jesus said to them in response, surely in verse 31, Matthew 21, 31, surely I say to you that tax collectors and harlots are entering the kingdom before you. Wow. Those that they despised were actually turning to Christ. And that's the way it always is. It's the people who feel the need for him that turn to him. Do you have a need for him? Or are you satisfied with yourself and with life as it is? Do you need Jesus? It doesn't matter whether you're a tax collector or a harlot or a sinner. That's the kind of people that were attracted to Jesus and to his kingdom. And then we uh, quickly, I just want to pass through a, a couple other verses here. I'll just reference them. In Luke 9, before the transfiguration, Jesus said to those who were standing there with him, he says, there are some standing here today who will not see death till they see the kingdom of God. Obviously, this was not the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven that we often think of when we talk about the coming of Christ and going to heaven with him. Yes, there is that aspect to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. What's important for us today to understand is that the kingdom of heaven that is there above is also in the earth. It is the same kingdom, and it carries with it the presence of the same King, Jesus Christ, and all of his power. We're going to come a little more to this just as we go on. Verse uh, chapter 10 of Luke, the next chapter, Jesus tells his disciples, Go and heal the sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. And then the next chapter, Luke 11, he says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, which, we, which he was doing plenty of in those days, and we actually talked about that previously. If I cast out, Jesus says, demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. There's one more verse that we have not read that I want to take you to. And it's Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 17, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and they say to him, when is the kingdom this kingdom that you're referencing, when is this kingdom going to come? And he answered them, the kingdom of God, an interchangeable term for the kingdom of heaven, they're the same thing. The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For the kingdom of God indeed is among you. And another way of saying that, and I just say it's the same, it's both. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is within you. Jesus Christ, just before he went back to heaven, spent 40 days. It says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, he spent 40 days before he ascended to heaven for the last time, he spent 40 days with his disciples talking about what does it say there? Things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He had established his kingdom on earth. He had established his kingdom here. He brought it here with him. And now he was instructing the disciples for 40 days. My, what a seminar that was. 40 days he was instructing them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God, which they would then continue 
in the earth when he had returned to his father. So what is the nature of this kingdom? Is it a place? Is it a state of mind? Is it real or imaginary? Is it like Disneyland, a place that you go and then you come home? Is it tangible? Is it something we can touch? We can experience? Is it visible? I want to share with you something that I have written to summarize what I want to say this morning. I don't like reading my message, but this time I want to read something that I have been led to share with you as a result of my study this morning. And I'm going to read it to you the way I wrote it. I believe this is from God. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom from heaven to earth, established here on earth by Jesus Christ. It is a kingdom that exists now and into eternity to come. It is real. It is visible. It is literal. It is unending. And Jesus is at the center of it. He is the royal figure in this kingdom. The kingdom of heaven came to this earth when Christ came to this earth. Its presence in the earth was demonstrated in his life, his teachings, his ministry, his death. And the cross of Calvary was heaven's flag planted in earthly soil. And when he returned to his father, his kingdom remained on earth. Hidden, listen, listen to me. <laughs> Hidden, his kingdom remained on earth. Hidden and protected from the forces of evil. In the fortresses of the hearts of his followers a kingdom against which the forces of hell will never prevail. That's the one reason it's so important for us to protect our hearts. Don't let just anyone into your heart. Don't let just anything into your heart. Protect your heart. Make it a fortress of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I think of the embassies that the United States has all around the world in various countries. And I'm going to make this assumption. I, I don't know this. I don't know a lot about embassies. I've never had to, to go to one. I've never had to be in one. But my understanding of our embassies is that they are like a capsule of life, a capsule of life of America in a compound, in a fenced in, walled in area that is protected from all of the forces that are outside, even in hostile forces. The American embassy is a place of safety where Americans go during crisis to find safety. They are like a kingdom satellite. They are, they are almost like a satellite of the kingdom of the United States, if you please. They are a satellite in which life is protected and safe and the principles of our American system are honored and kept safely protected within their walls. I like to think of the kingdom of heaven like that. God has his embassies throughout the earth. You're one. I'm one. A place where God's kingdom is present and the principles of his kingdom are kept and honored. It is a place of safety from the evil one. It is a place that is protected by the presence of God himself. And it is, it is the fortress of our hearts, the fortresses of our hearts. 
kingdom of heaven has aspects to it that are both now and not yet. Yeah. It is a kingdom that in that that is relative to life on this earth as today. But it also has an extension into the presence of God in heaven. There is more experience, there is more for us to experience on the other side after Christ's return. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is right here in our midst today, right here where we are gathered together this morning. We see it in each other's eyes and in the bonds of love we have for one another. We see it in the awakening of our spirit when Christ comes near to us, when we see him working with a strong arm on our behalf, when the gospel thrills our hearts, when the characteristics of the spirit show themselves in our lives and in the lives of others. We see the kingdom operative when good overcomes evil, when the sick are healed, when the blind see and the deaf hear, when forgiveness overcomes injury, when we see hearts responding to Christ, when our lives are protected and sustained by the providence and provisions of God. The kingdom of heaven is a literal place that is hidden within the hearts of the followers of Christ, where it is ever protected from the assault of the agents of the kingdom of darkness. There is no way that Satan can assault the kingdom of God within us. It is protected within us. As long as we're living in that kingdom, we are safe from his, from his attacks on us. But this kingdom is also a place from which life is visibly expressed in a world of darkness, where light and hope to those who sit in darkness and pain and hopelessness is emanated from this kingdom that is within. That's my message for today. My invitation, repent. Turn your back on your tainted past. Turn your back on it. God will turn his back on it. He says, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west into the depths of the sea. Turn your back on your guilty past. Change your perspective on the present. Live today in the awareness and the consciousness of the kingdom of God being present here and turn your heart toward a future with Christ. For the kingdom of heaven is in our midst and Jesus wants to build an embassy of his kingdom within your heart. That's my appeal to you this morning. Next week, we're going to talk about some interesting names in the Bible. The name Michael. Who is Michael in the Bible? Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? And who is the angel of the Lord that is referenced a number of times, particularly in the Old Testament? Who is the angel of the Lord? I want to talk about that next week. Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, this morning, we are so grateful to be a part of your kingdom, invited by grace into this great place where you dwell, where the characters of your kingdom live and move and interact with us in our lives here on earth. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone out there who is still living in darkness, in the shadow of death, as Jesus said, as the Bible said, that they will 
see in this message hope and that they will turn their faces toward you, their hearts toward you, and heed your invitation to come. And know that in no wise will they be cast off. You said that. And know that the moment they place their faith in you, the moment they enter that kingdom, that place where you are, they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And they enter into the beginning of what will be everlasting life. Thank you for your life and death on our behalf, O oh Lord, for your grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen.